So this is chapter 23, the respiratory system. And we'll start with an introduction and talk about the functions of the respiratory system and its organization. So first, a quick review of something that we covered way back in AMP1 in chapter 3 when we talked about cells. And that is all of our cells have organelles called mitochondria. And the mitochondria's job is to produce ATP that is needed to power almost every cellular function. And so far we've talked about several things that require ATP. And so just virtually everything that the cells and thus the tissues and thus the organs do require ATP as an energy source. So as a reminder, the mitochondria inside our cells act as the energy factory for making ATP. And in this process, they use glucose and oxygen to produce the ATP, and the waste products are carbon dioxide and water. So mitochondria require oxygen in order to make the ATP, and they produce carbon dioxide as a waste product. So one of the primary functions of the respiratory system is to get the oxygen needed by our cells into our body and also to release the carbon dioxide that accumulates as waste to the outside of our body. And then as a reminder, the cardiovascular system, which we covered earlier in chapter, chapters 19 to 21, is responsible for shuttling these gases back and forth from the body cells to the lungs. So the respiratory system is composed of all of the structures that are involved in ventilation and gas exchange. Ventilation is the process of getting air into and out of the lungs. And then gas exchange is the movement of gases into and out of the blood. So there are five total functions of the respiratory system. The first is that it provides an extensive surface area for the gas exchange between the air and the blood. It also moves air to and from the exchange surfaces in the lungs. This is the ventilation portion. It also has structures that protect respiratory surfaces from dehydration, temperature changes, and pathogens. It also produces sounds for communication, so we wouldn't be able to talk or sing or otherwise use our voices without the respiratory system. And it facilitates the detection of odors by the olfactory receptors, which we covered back in Chapter 17. So the respiratory system is organized into two main parts. So when we talk about the upper respiratory system, we're talking about the nose, the nasal cavity, the paranasal sinuses, which were covered in A and P1 when we talked about the axial skeleton, and the pharynx, which is the anatomical term for the throat. Then there is the lower respiratory system, which is composed of the larynx, the trachea, various bronchi and bronchioles, and then the alveoli, which are the little air sacs where gas exchange takes place. When we talk about the respiratory tract, we are referencing all of the passageways that carry air to and from the exchange surfaces. So this would be the nasal cavity, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, and the bronchioles. And then we also have the alveoli, which is the site of gas exchange between the air and blood. In this section, we'll talk about respiratory mucosa and the respiratory defense system. So the respiratory mucosa is the mucous membrane that lines the respiratory tract. And back in a and 1, we talked about four types of tissue membranes. There was a cutaneous membrane, a mucous membrane, a synovial membrane, and then a serous membrane. And so this is one of those four types of membranes. And if you remember, each of these membranes has both a layer of epithelial tissue with connective tissue underneath, usually areolar connective tissue. So with the respiratory mucosa, we do have the layer of epithelium, 
and we do have the underlying connective tissue, which is uh, a type of areolar tissue. And when we talk about mucous membranes, the underlying connective tissue has a name, and it's called the lamina propria. So the uh, respiratory epithelium is going to be pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And so that's shown here in this image. So we covered the different types of tissue back in A and P1. And so now that we're looking at the respiratory system, this is our first uh, chance of getting to look at organs that are lined by the ciliated columnar epithelial cells. And then in this image, you can also see the lamina propria, which is the underlying areolar tissue. But when it is in a mucous membrane, we give it a special name and call it a lamina propria. So the epithelial cells do have cilia on them, and the cilia are going to help move the mucus. And so the epithelium also has mucus cells, which are shown here, it's these ye uh, yellow cells that are squeezed between the columnar epithelial cells, and these mucus cells are going to secrete the mucus. Now, there are some exceptions, so not 100% of the respiratory system has pseudostratified columnar epithelium. There are some portions of the pharynx that actually have stratified squamous epithelium, especially the areas where you have food pass through your throat, and because food can be rough and abrasive, you need a more protective type of tissue in those areas. And then the uh, alveoli, the air sacs themselves, are lined with the simple squamous epithelium, which are those flat, thin cells that look a little bit like fried eggs. And you need to have a very thin cell in those areas because you have diffusion across those cells from the blood into the air and vice versa. But for the most part, the, res the respiratory epithelium is going to be composed of pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Now, in the upper respiratory system, which is from your pharynx up, the lamina propria also contains mucus glands, which is shown here, that also secrete mucus. So in the upper respiratory system, you are getting mucus secretion from two different places, the mucus glands and the mucus cells. In the lower respiratory system, the lamina propria has smooth muscle cells embedded in it, which can change the diameter of the respiratory passageways, as we'll talk about later. So we do have a respiratory defense system whose job is to filter out any debris or pathogens in the air that we inhale or breathe in. So very large particles are filtered out by the nasal hairs in our nasal cavities, and when they do filter out these large particles, they're usually stuck in mucus within our nasal cavity, and this is what actually forms boogers in your nose. And this is weird. No one has ever come up with an anatomical official term for booger. And then the mucus is going to trap all particles that are larger than 10 micrometers. And the mucus, as I mentioned earlier, is produced both by the mucus cells embedded in the epithelial cells and the mucus glands in the upper respiratory system. And so here's a picture again that we saw on the previous page where you can see that you do have mucus cells that are in, in between the columnar cells and then in the upper respiratory system you also have mucus glands. So the cilia on the epithelial cells do help to sweep the mucus toward the pharynx. And as a reminder, if you look up here in the upper right, the pharynx uh, is going to include a portion where air, food, and water all travel. And so at the bottom part of the pharynx, you can either go into the esophagus or you can go into the larynx, which is uh, part of the respiratory system. So if in a uh, in cases above where your esophagus opening are, the cilia don't really have to work that hard because your mucus can drain downward, and then every time you swallow, it'll go into your esophagus. But the mucus that is produced in the lower respiratory system actually gets swept upwards, 
So upwards up the trachea, up the larynx, and into the pharynx, where again, when you swallow, it will go down your esophagus. So the cilia is sweeping the mucus towards the pharynx to be swallowed and subjected to the stomach acid, which will cover in the digestive system. And so because in the lower respiratory system, the mucus is being moved upward, this is called the mucociliary elevator because the cilia on these um, epithelial cells are actually moving the mucus in a direction against gravity. So up your bronchioles, up your trachea, up to your pharynx so that you can then swallow it. The rate of mucus production speeds up when exposed to allergens or pathogens. So this is why when you have allergies or you get a cold, you start producing copious amounts of mucus and you end up with like a runny nose or you have to keep clearing your throat or you have to keep coughing. Very small particles, so between one and five micrometers, are trapped in mucus that are in the smallest bronchioles and in the alveoli of the lungs. And again, these are going to be brought upwards um, with the mucociliary elevator. They're going to be moved up out of the respiratory system and into the esophagus. Very, very small par particles, so ones that are too small um, to really get trapped in the mucus, are actually trapped and phagocytized by macrophages that hang out inside the alveoli, alveoli and so they are called alveolar macrophages and we'll mention them again later when we look at the structure of the alveoli. So when the defense system breaks down you can have something like tuberculosis which is abbreviated TB. So tuberculosis occurs when a bacteria called mycobacterium tuberculosis overwhelms the respiratory defenses and causes disease. So the bacteria colonize the respiratory passageways, the interstitial spaces between cells, and or the alveoli themselves. In some people, they can have the bacteria in their respiratory system, but the infection, having the bacteria in the body, never actually causes disease. And this is called a latent infection. And so it depends on the immune system's ability to keep the bacteria in check. So if you have a healthy immune system, you may have the mycobacterium tuberculosis and never know it because you're never going to display any symptoms because the bacteria can never grow to a level that they actually cause disease and problems. In the olden days, this was called consumption because you would continually get worse and worse until usually tuberculosis would kill you. And it's estimated that as many as one-third of the world's population is currently infected with TB. And like I said, just because you have an infection doesn't mean you actually have the disease. And so this is why they give you skin tests, especially if you're going into the healthcare field. The TB skin test will indicate whether you have the bacteria or not. Um, so if you do have a latent infection, you may never know until you get a positive skin test. But they need to know this because even if you have a latent infection, you can still spread the bacteria to others. And so it's important if you're going to be working in a healthcare field to know whether you have a latent infection or not. Cystic fibrosis is a condition where the respiratory mucosa produces dense viscous mucus due to a genetic mutation. And so because the mucus is so thick and so dense, the mucociliary elevator that moves the mucus up to be swallowed stops working. So the mucus basically pulls and stays inside the respiratory passageways, and this results in frequent infections because bacteria can then colonize the mucus and start dividing. So remember, the purpose of the mucus is to catch those bacteria, sweep them toward the pharynx, you swallow them, and your stomach acid kills them. But if the mucus is just sitting there and not going anywhere, the bacteria are happy to use it as a food source and they can start growing and dividing out of control. So uh, people with cystic fibrosis end up having frequent respiratory infections and the thick mucus also makes breathing difficult because it can clog the respiratory passageways. And currently uh, the average lifespan of someone born with cystic fibrosis is only 37 years of age.
In this section, we'll look at the nose, the nasal cavity, and the paranasal sinuses, and also talk about the function of the nasal mucosa. So the nose is the primary passageway for air entering the respiratory system, and air enters through paired nostrils, also called nares, and the ones on the outside are called the external nares. So the epithelium in the initial part of the nose has coarse hairs. These are your nose hairs, and the purpose of these is to trap airborne particles. And then the nasal cavity is the chamber located between the external and internal nares. So again, the external nares are your nostrils. The internal nares are going to be back here behind the nasal cavity, and they're also called the coenae. So the nasal cavity is divided into right and left sides by the nasal septum. And the nasal septum is part bony, so there's a portion at the top made up of the ethmoid bone, a portion in the posterior uh, inferior part made up of the vomer, and then the front part is made up of primarily hyaline cartilage. So the nasal septum is part bony and part cartilaginous. If you've heard of someone who has a deviated septum, this is when the nasal septum is shifted away from the midline. So the septum should normally run right down the middle. And then if it deviates to one side or the other, as shown in this little black and white image, this can cause problems because the inside of the nose has a lot of protrusions in it that we're going to talk about in a minute. These are your conchi. And so if the septum gets deviated, that can cut off airflow on one side or the other. So the olfactory region of the nasal cavity is the superior portion, and we covered that in Chapter 17 when we talked about olfaction. The nasal conchi, also called turbinates, are projections into the nasal cavity from the lateral walls. The superior and middle nasal conchi are actually part of the ethmoid bone. And the inferior nasal conchi is a bone all by itself. And these were all bones that we talked about in A and P1. And then you can see that underneath the different nasal conchi, there are little passageways that are called meatuses. And so the names of the meatuses go along with the names of the conchi. So under the superior concha is a superior meatus, etc. So airflow through and around the nasal conchi provide turbulence. And so you can see in this image from your textbook where they are taking a, a frontal or coronal section through this man's head, you can see just how intricate the passageways are through the nasal cavity. And so by providing the turbulence, the air can be kept in the nasal cavity just a little bit longer, which keeps it in contact with the nasal mucosa for a longer period of time. And in a couple of slides, we'll look at why that is important. And so here is a picture again to kind of show the turbulence. So in this particular image, each different little air molecule is shown by a different ribbon. So instead of just coming in the external nares and going straight back, you can see how they kind of flip and turn and twirl and twist. And that is the turbulence caused by the conchi, which again, the purpose is to keep the air in contact with the nasal mucosa for a longer period of time. So now let's look at the floor of the nasal cavity, which is also the roof or the top of the oral cavity, and it is made up of two parts. The first is the hard palate, which is the bony portion that is formed by the maxillae and palatine bones, and again, those were covered last semester. And then the posterior portion is called the soft palate, and this is the fleshy posterior portion that is going to separate the nasopharynx from the oral cavity, and we'll talk more about the pharynx in an upcoming section. So as mentioned before, the coenae is another name for the internal nares. So this is the posterior border of the nasal cavity. So the nasal cavity runs from the external nares or nostrils to the coenae or internal nares. Also, the nasolacrimal ducts that we talked about in Chapter 17 when we looked at the eye empty into the nasal cavity. And as mentioned in Chapter 17, this is why you get a runny nose when you cry. <laughs>
So the paranasal sinuses are air-filled spaces in some of the cranial and facial bones that are lined with respiratory mucosa and joined to the nasal cavity through small openings. And so you have paranasal sinuses in these five bones, your frontal bone, sphenoid, ethmoid, your maxillary, and your palatine. In most pictures, they don't show the palatine sinuses because they're so small, but they will show the other four large ones. So the frontal sinus up here above your eyes, then you've got the little small ethmoid sinuses, a large uh, sphenoid sinus, and then a maxillary sinus in both of your maxilla bones on either side of your face. So the paranasal sinuses are lined with the same mucosa as the nasal cavity has, and so they do produce mucus as well. And if you get inflammation in these areas, the swelling that accompanies the inflammation can block the openings into the nasal cavity, and then the mucus can start building up. And as I mentioned on a previous slide, uh, bacteria that gets trapped in the mucus normally gets flushed to the uh, pharynx where you swallow it and it goes to your stomach. But if that mucus gets trapped, the bacteria can start using it as a food source and divide and multiply, and this causes an infection. So poor mucus drainage from the sinuses can lead to sinusitis, which is an infection of the sinuses. So the mucosa of the nasal cavity and the sinuses functions to prepare inhaled air for arrival into the lower respiratory system. So you have very extensive vascularization in the nasal mucosa, and this means lots of arteries, veins, and capillaries. And what's more, you have even additional large, highly expandable veins in the lamina propria of the three nasal conchi. So the purpose of having all of this extra blood flow to the mucosa of the nasal cavity and sinuses is to warm and humidify the air that you are breathing in. So as you're breathing in and that air is swirling around, the heat is moving from the blood because the blood is being brought very close to the surface. The heat is moving from the blood to the air to warm the air up before it makes it to your lungs. And then that extra heat from the blood is also evaporating water in the mucus, which is adding humidity to the air. So again, before the air goes into your lungs, it gets heated up and it gets humidified or, or uh, saturated with water vapor. And again, if we go back to the idea of the turbulence in your nasal cavity that is caused by having those nasal conchi, um, one of the reasons we have that turbulence is to keep the air in contact with the mucosa for a longer period of time so that you have time to warm and humidify that air before it goes to your lungs. And the reason that, that this is done is because it provides the more delicate surfaces that are found in the lower respiratory system from chilling or drying out, like the alveoli or air sacs of the lungs. If these guys chill or dry out, that is bad news. And so we want the air that is going into our lungs to be warm and moist. Furthermore, when we breathe out, the uh, high vascularization to the nasal mucosa can also help us recover some of the heat and moisture that is in that uh, hot, moist air that is being exhaled. So in this time, the air is coming up and it's uh, really warm and it's uh, got a lot of moisture in it. And so again, the blood is close to the surface so the blood can absorb some of the excess heat and it can also uh, absorb some of that moisture into the mucus. And so that way the body doesn't lose too much heat and moisture when breathing out. And you can try this if you've ever held a mirror or like your glasses or any type of piece of glass and you blow on it with your nose, you may see a little bit of fog that fogs up the surface of the mirror or glass, but not as much as if you breathe out of your mouth. So if you breathe out of your mouth, you'll notice you actually don't have this uh, protection from heat loss and water loss that your nose provides. So again, the purpose of the mucosa in the nose is to warm and humidify incoming air and then to prevent heat loss and water loss from air that you are exhaling or breathing out. And as I mentioned, the turbulence provided by the conchi makes sure that the air stays in contact with the mucosa for longer so that you do have time uh, to do these two processes.
A nosebleed, which is called an epistaxis, is actually fairly common due to the extensive vascularization in the nose. And again, the extensive vascularization is to have the extra blood flow close to the uh, surface of the mucosa in the nose so that we can um, have this heat and water exchange both ways. And as I mentioned, if you breathe through your mouth, you are eliminating the filtration of the air because you don't have nasal hairs or a lot of mucus in your uh, oral cavity. You're also eliminating the heating and the humidifying. And then if you breathe out through your mouth, you are losing a lot more heat and water with each breath than if you breathe out through your nose. So if you, a patient is in the hospital and they're on a, resp a respirator or a mechanical ventilator, these uh, respirators have to actually filter, humidify, and heat the air before it goes into the patient, or you could damage their alveoli. So again, the purpose of heating and moisturizing the air is to protect the structures in the lower respiratory system. In this short section, we'll look at the pharynx. So the pharynx, otherwise known as the throat, is a muscular passageway shared by both the, the digestive tract and the respiratory tract. It runs from the coenae, which are the internal nares, to the entrances of the larynx and the esophagus. So it's divided into three regions, and in this picture the three regions are given different colors. So the nasopharynx is the superior region that is colored in yellow. It is separated from the oral cavity by the soft palate, which is the non-bony uh, bottom of the nasal cavity and top of the oral cavity. It contains the pharyngeal tonsils that we talked about in uh, chapter 22. It also contains the opening to the auditory tube, which connects to the middle ear, as discussed in chapter 17. The next section is the oropharynx, which is colored in green. Think of this as being behind the mouth or oral cavity. So this is the middle portion of the pharynx that runs from the level of the soft palate to the base of the tongue where you also have the uh, hyoid bone. And then the laryngopharynx, which is colored in uh, purple, is the inferior portion and it extends from the hyoid bone to the entrance of the larynx and esophagus. It can also sometimes be called the hypopharynx, but in your textbook uh, we're calling it the laryngopharynx. In this section we'll talk about the larynx and sound production. And I will put an article on D2L um, about how the cat has some extra pads in its larynx which allows it to purr. So the larynx is a complex cartilaginous structure that surrounds and protects the glottis and the vocal cords. So the glottis is a slit-like opening between the vocal cords and this area uh, with the glottis and the vocal cord cords inside the larynx is also sometimes referred to as the voice box. So here is a picture here looking down into the larynx and so the vocal folds or the vocal cords are these white structures here the two white lines, and so the space between them is what we call the glottis. So the larynx itself has three unpaired cartilages that are bound together by ligaments. The first one of these is the thyroid cartilage, which is the largest laryngeal cartilage, and it actually protrudes out in the front of the throat. So it's what you see when you see someone's Adam's apple. You can also feel uh, the bump at the front of your throat. It can also be called the laryngeal prominence. The next cartilage is the cricoid cartilage. This is the most inferior of the laryngeal cartilages, so it is at the bottom of the larynx, and then below that is where we'll have the trachea and tracheal cartilages, which we'll talk about um, in the next section. The third unpaired cartilage is the epiglottis, which is a large shoehorn-shaped cartilage that forms a flexible lid that can close over top of the glottis, which again is the opening between the vocal cords.
The larynx also contains three smaller pairs of hyaline cartilage, but we're not going to go into that level of detail in this lecture. So when you swallow, the larynx is elevated by your laryngeal muscles, and you can feel this if you rest your fingers gently on the front of your throat where you feel your Adam's apple or your thyroid cartilage, and then you swallow, you can actually feel your larynx rising up. And so when the larynx rises up, this causes the epiglottis to fold over a closed glottis and prevent any food from entering the respiratory tract. So here's an image. So this is the large tongue here. So this is a bolus of food. So that's food that we've chewed up and mixed with saliva. And we're in the act of swallowing it. So right in this first picture, A here is going to the back, very back of the oral cavity behind the tongue. And so at this point, the epiglottis is pointing upwards and the opening to the trachea is still um, open and vulnerable for something going in it. But the larynx will raise up, and as the larynx raises up, it closes the epiglottis down. So the food will slide behind it and down into the esophagus instead of going into the respiratory tract. The soft palate also rises during swallowing to block off the nasal cavity. And so here's a different picture. So in this picture, the blue arrow is showing the passage of air. And then I have the bolus of food here that I'm about to swallow, this green blob in the mouth. And so currently, my, um, I'm breathing as well as I'm chewing, and so the opening to my respiratory tract is open, and the opening to the esophagus is currently closed. And then when you swallow, the tongue raises up to block the oral cavity, the soft palate raises up to block the nasal cavity, the larynx rises to cause the epiglottis to fold over, which then blocks the opening to the respiratory tract, and food will slide down the esophagus instead. And then when you're done swallowing, it all reverses again. If food or liquid touches either the vestibular or vocal folds, which are part of the uh, sound production um, structures, you will have a violent coughing reflex in which your respiratory system is forcefully expelling air to try to get the foreign matter out of the respiratory tract. So the vocal folds, also known as the vocal cords, are highly elastic ligaments that are involved with the production of sound, and they're shown in both of these images as these white structures here in the very middle. And as a reminder, um, the glottis is that space between the two vocal folds. It can also be called the rima glottitis, but it's easier just to say glottis. So air passing through the glottis when it is open will vibrate these vocal folds, and that will produce sound waves. The vestibular folds, also called the false vocal cords, are superior to the vocal fo folds, and they contain the vestibular ligaments. And when you're looking at pictures like this from your textbook, it's kind of hard to see that the vestibular folds are superior to the vocal folds because it looks more like they're medial and lateral in this type of picture. So I found another picture to show you a more accurate representation. So you can see that the vocal folds are sticking out down here on the inferior side, and the vestibular folds are actually above them so they are superior, and they do help to protect the vocal folds. And again, the space between the vocal folds is called the glottis. So with sound production, uh, we'll look at different aspects of sound production, starting with pitch. So pitch is sort of the uh, whether you have a really high voice or a really low voice. And pitch is determined by the diameter and length of your vocal folds. And this is determined by your age or your sex. So in short, the larger the vocal folds, the lower your pitch, and the smaller your vocal folds, the higher your pitch. So children have smaller vocal folds than adults, and so this is why children have higher pitched voices than adults. And men typically have larger larynxes than women, therefore they have larger vocal folds, and this is why men tend to have deeper voices than women. You can also control your pitch uh, 
by controlling the tension in the vocal folds with ligaments and muscles like I just did a few minutes ago. So if you add tension, you can get a higher pitch voice. And if you relax the tension, you can get a lower pitch voice. So you can control uh, the tension somewhat. The rest of it is determined by age and sex. So phonation is the actual raw sound production. So imagine like when you're in the doctor's office and they put the tongue depressor on your tongue and they tell you to say, ah, right, that is phonation. That is just the raw production of sound. And then modification of those sounds by voluntary movements of other structures, including your tongue, teeth, and lips, is what we call articulation. So you can take the ah uh, sound and turn it into hot by articulating. And then the sound can be further resonated or amplified by the openings within your um, respiratory system, so the pharynx, the oral cavity, the nasal cavity, and even the paranasal sinuses can all add amplification and resonance to the sound that is coming out. And this is why your voice will sound different when you have a cold. And for example, your nose is all stuffed up with mucus. Your voice sounds different because you're having a different level of resonance or amplification. And then laryngitis is when you have an infection or an inflammation of the larynx, which can cause hoarseness or a complete loss of your voice. In this section, we'll look at the trachea and the bronchial tree, and this is going to include the bronchi and bronchioles. So the trachea, more commonly called the windpipe, is the airway extending from the larynx to the main bronchi. So this is a tough, flexible tube that serves as a passageway for air into and out of the lungs. It is composed of 15 to 20 C-shaped tracheal cartilages. And in the pictures, uh, the cartilage is always shown as light blue. So as you descend down the trachea, you can see these little blue rings. Those are the tracheal cartilages. These cartilages stiffen the walls of the trachea and help to protect the airway. And they prevent collapsing or overexpansion during the pressure changes that take place during ventilation or breathing, which we'll talk about later. So here is a cross section so that you can see the C-shaped cartilage, the C-shaped uh, tracheal cartilage, and in the middle you have the lumen of the trachea where the air is going to flow. So the submucosa of the uh, mucosa membrane, and so submucosa means the layer underneath the mucosa membrane, has tracheal glands that secrete mucus. So another structure secreting mucus in the respiratory tract. Also note that the open part of the C faces posteriorly and the esophagus sits right behind the trachea so the open part of the C is facing the esophagus. There is a tracheallis muscle that runs from one end of the C-shaped cartilage to the other and this tracheallis muscle can be contracted and relaxed to control the diameter of the tracheal lumen and this control is done by the autonomic nervous system. So now let's look at the bronchial tree, and it's called a bronchial tree because just like trees, it starts with a very thick trunk. In this case, the trunk would be the trachea, and then you have uh, subsequent branches, and at each branching point, um, the branches get smaller and smaller, just like you see with a tree. So at the bottom of the trachea, the first branching point is into a left and right main bronchus. So you have a left main bronchus and then a right main bronchus, which has been cut off in this picture. These can also be called primary bronchi. And you have one main bronchus for each lung. So you have two lungs, two main bronchi. And notice that bronchus is singular and bronchi is plural. The main bronchi also have a C-shaped cartilage that wraps around them, but the ends of the C overlap, so there is not that open space between the two ends of the sea. 
Also, the right main bronchus is larger than the left main bronchus, and that is because the right lung has three lobes, and so it's going to have to have more branching points. Mm -hmm. So the right main bronchus is larger, and so as a consequence, when people do choke or uh, breathe in objects into the respiratory system, it is usually likely for that object to get stuck in the right main bronchus. So then the main bronchi divide into what are called lobar bronchi. These are also called secondary bronchi. And there is one lobar bronchus for each lobe of the lung. So on the right side where you have three lobes, you would have three lobar bronchi. And on the left side where you only have two lobes, you would only have two lobar bronchi. And then the lobar bronchi are going to divide into segmental bronchi, and these are also called tertiary bronchi. And you have one segmental bronchus for each bronchopulmonary segment. So in the right lung, there are a total of 10 segments, so there are 10 segmental bronchi. The left lung has between 8 and 9 segments, so between 8 and 9 segmental bronchi. So as you move uh, down the bronchial tree and get to the smaller branches, you have progressively less cartilage. And as the cartilage decreases, the amount of smooth muscle increases. And smooth muscle is going to allow the autonomic nerve system to change the diameter. So at the very bottom of the tree, you have the bronchioles and the terminal bronchioles and both of these are the uh, smallest passageways. They have no cartilage at this point, only smooth muscle. And one segmental bronchus can branch into about 6,500 terminal bronchioles, so we are getting uh, very small at this point. The bronchioles and terminal bronchioles act uh, similar in concept to the arterioles that we talked about in chapter 21. So because they have only smooth muscle and their diameter can be changed, the diameter of the bronchioles can have a big effect on the resistance to airflow moving through the lungs. Bronchitis is when you have inflammation and constriction of the bronchioles during a respiratory infection. This is also going to increase the resistance to airflow and make breathing difficult. So bronchodilation is when you have an increase in the diameter of the bronchioles. This is controlled by the sympathetic fight or flight division of the autonomic nervous system. And by increasing the diameter of the bronchioles, you are making more space to air for air to pass through. So you are decreasing resistance to airflow. So you're making it easier to breathe. Bronchoconstriction is a decrease in the diameter of the bronchioles. This is controlled by the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, so the rest and digest division. And because you're making the passage for the airflow smaller, you are increasing resistance to airflow and making it more difficult to breathe. Allergic reactions can cause bronchoconstriction, and this is due to the histamine that is released as part of the inflammatory response. And this is why if someone has an allergic reaction, you will typically give them an injection of epinephrine, like in an EpiPen, because the epinephrine is the neurotransmitter used by the sympathetic division, and it causes bronchodilation, so it will counteract the bronchoconstriction that is brought on by the allergic reaction. Asthma is a condition of chronic inflammation of the bronchioles. So on the left here, this would be a normal airway. In the middle would be the airway of a person who has asthma when they're uh, just having their normal everyday activities and they're not actually having an attack. So even at normal condition, they have uh, inflammation and reduced airway diameter. And then during an asthmatic attack, the uh, bronchoconstriction can further narrow the airway uh, passage and can almost completely prevent airflow.
and this is why they need inhalers that have medications that uh, allow bronchodilation and allow the passageways to open back up. In this section, we're going to look at the respiratory bronchioles and the pulmonary lobules, and also look at a summary of the airflow pathway. So at the end of our last discussion on the bronchial tree, we ended with terminal bronchioles. So now we're going to pick up from there. So each terminal bronchiole is going to deliver air to a single pulmonary lobule. And so a pulmonary lobule would be like represented here in this top right picture. And then this is a close-up view of a single pulmonary lobule. So the lobules are divided from other lobules by an interlobular septa. And it is shown right here, the interlobular septum would be this barrier right here that would separate this lobule from the next lobule. And notice that the interlobular septa is continuous with the visceral pleura, which is the membrane that lines the outside of the lung itself. So the visceral pleura will be on the outside, and then it's going to dive in to form these interlobular septum that divides one lobule from another. So here's an image to kind of help you visualize this a little bit better. So if we look at the larger lung, we can think of it as divided into all of these little lobules that are separated by a membrane. And so each lobule is going to have its own branch of pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins. So once we get inside a pulmonary lobule, the terminal bronchiole, and again, one terminal bronchiole per lobule, the terminal bronchial will divide into smaller respiratory bronchioles. And these are the thinnest, most delicate branches of the bronchial tree. So it's a little hard in the uh, textbook picture to see the respiratory bronchioles, which is why I provided this picture up here. So again, this would be a single lobule, um, lobule and you can see how it is divided from other lobules by the interlobular septa. And then we have a terminal bronchial bringing air into this particular lobule. So these small branches here would be the respiratory bronchioles. So these are going to actually deliver air to the alveoli or air sacs of the lung. Each lobule is also going to receive a branch of the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein. And I want to remind you that pulmonary arteries are shown in blue because they carry deoxygenated blood, and pulmonary veins are shown in red because they carry oxygenated blood. So the pulmonary vein, and they have it backwards up here in this top picture, so I apologize, the colors are wrong in that one. But in your textbook, you can see the pulmonary artery here in blue and the pulmonary veins here in red. You also have lymphatic vessels that go to each lobule, as well as branches of nerves. So now let's look at the summary of airflow through the bronchial tree. So we started with the trachea. Air then moves into the main bronchus, and again we have one of these for each lung, so two main bronchi. Then the air will move into a lobar bronchus, and we have one of these per lobe. So three on the right side and two on the left side. Then air moves into the segmental bronchus, and we have one of these per bronchopulmonary segment, which is eight to 10 per lung. Then air is gonna move into smaller bronchioles. And then finally into a terminal bronchiole. And as we just mentioned, you have one terminal bronchiole per pulmonary lobule. Then once we're inside the lobule, the terminal bronchioles branch into respiratory bronchioles. And then as we're going to see in a moment, air then passes into alveolar ducts and sacs, and then into the alveoli, which is where the gas exchange takes place. So in this section, we'll look at the structure of the alveoli, talk about surfactant, and the blood-air barrier, also called the respiratory membrane. So the respiratory bronchioles that branch from the terminal bronchiole are going to connect to alveolar ducts, and the alveolar ducts then connect to these large alveolar sacs. And each alveolar sac 
opens into many individual alveoli. Each lung contains about 150 million alveoli, so a very extensive surface area for gas exchange. Each alveolus is associated with an extensive capillary network, so you can see from the picture in your textbook, each one of these little air sacs is extensively covered by capillaries and each alveolus is also surrounded by elastic fibers which is shown in this image as these uh, lighter red fibers surrounding the outside of the capillaries and these elastic fibers they work just like rubber bands so they stretch when you breathe in and the uh, alveoli expand with air and then they recoil or snap back which helps with exhalation or getting the air out of the lungs So if we look at the structure of a single alveolus, so here is our alveolar sac, here is a single alveolus down here. So they are lined by simple squamous epithelium, and that is shown by these purple cells. We have roaming alveolar macrophages shown here that patrol and engulf debris and pathogens that make it this far that don't get trapped by the rest of the respiratory defense system that we covered earlier. And then you actually have the alveolar epithelial cells, and there are two types of epithelial cells that you find here. The first one is called pneumocytes type 1, and that is the uh, cells shown here that are actually uh, purple. So you've got a lot of these. These are the most common types of cells. They are unusually thin, and they are part of the blood-air barrier uh, where air is going to cross but, or um, gases is going to cross from the air inside the sacs into the blood inside the capillaries. So the pneumocytes type 1 is where you have the site of gas diffusion. The other type of cell are the pneumocytes type 2 and those are shown in this picture as the scattered yellow cells. So the cells are scattered around and they are larger and the purpose of these is to produce a substance called surfactant. So surfactant is a lipid secretion that coats the alveolar surface and prevents their collapse. So in this picture, we have uh, two alveolar type 1 cells. There's one up here and one down here. Actually, there's three. I see a third nucleus. And then it's also showing you the alveolar type 2 cell, uh, which is making the surfactant. And then in this picture, you can see the surfactant layer. These are actually like tiny little phospholipids, so the same type of phospholipid that makes up our cell membranes, except it's a single layer. So it's got a hydrophilic head on one end and hydrophobic tails on the other. And so it forms a superficial coating over a thin layer of water called alveolar fluid. And basically, the water that uh, coats the inside of the alveoli might actually be able to stick with water on the other side. And so think about like if you have a glass that's sweating and you put that glass down on the thin coaster and then you pick the glass up and it brings the coaster with it, that is due to the surface tension of water. And so the same thing could happen with the walls of the alveoli. The uh, one side of the alveoli, the water could get stuck to the water on the other side and completely close off this airspace. And so the purpose of having the surfactant is to reduce the surface tension of the water and to prevent the alveolar um, space from collapsing. So the bottom line is surfactant keeps alveoli open. Respiratory distress syndrome occurs when not enough surfactant is produced. And then every time you exhale and this airspace gets smaller, the surface tension of the water allows the alveolus to completely collapse and the two sides stick to each other. And then you have absolutely no space left on the inside. So alveoli uh, collapse after every breath. And this requires a lot of energy to inhale Every time you inhale, you have to use extra energy to reopen all those alveoli and fight against the surface tension that's holding them closed so it can very quickly lead to exhaustion.
And then let's take a look at the blood air barrier, which is also called the respiratory membrane. This is the actual site of gas exchange, and it is made up of three layers. First, you have the epithelial cells that are lining the alveolus, and these are those pneumocytes type 1. And so this is showing you a bit of that cell here. Remember, these are squamous cells, so they're thin and flat. Then you have a fused basement membrane shown in gray in this picture. And then you have the endothelial cells that are lining the capillary. These are also simple squamous cells, so they are also thin and flat. So air ends up being separated from the blood by a very small distance. Only 0.5 micrometers is going to separate the air inside the alveoli from the blood inside the capillary. So this allows for very rapid diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And both of these gases are lipid soluble molecules that can pass directly through these plasma membranes. So you don't even need to worry about having um, protein channels or transporters. The gases can directly uh, diffuse from the blood to the air and vice versa. So pneumonia occurs when you have inflammation inside the lung. It can be caused by an infection like with a bacteria or virus, or it can be caused by inhaling particles that trigger an inflammatory response. And the inflammatory response causes fluid to leak into the alveoli. And so this is dangerous. So on the left side, we have a normal alveolus, and you can see the air um, is coming in and is separated from the blood by this very, very thin uh, blood air barrier. However, when you have pneumonia and fluid starts building up in the alveolus, this is going to be dangerous because now the presence of the fluid is going to increase the distance between the air and the blood and that is going to make gas exchange much less efficient. So oxygen would be unable to reach the bloodstream. Um, pneumonia, especially if it's caused by an infection, may only affect like one lobe at a time. So in this picture down here, this individual has pneumonia, but it is only in the lower lo lobe of the left lung. So that is one benefit to having the lung partitioned into a bunch of different subdivisions is that it can help to contain infections. But nevertheless, in this particular area of the lung, you would have very reduced um, gas exchange because of the fluid um, that is building up inside the air spaces. And pneumonia is more likely to occur if you have reduced respiratory defenses, and this could be caused by things like smoking, cystic fibrosis, where you're making that extra mucus, um, AIDS, where you have a problem with your immune system, etc. So now we'll look at the lung anatomy, including the blood supply and the pleural membranes. So each lung is divided into lobes. Both lungs have a superior lobe at the top. Both lungs have an inferior lobe at the bottom. The right lung has a middle lobe, and it is the only lung that has a middle lobe. So the right lung has a total of three lobes. The left lung has two lobes. The oblique fissure is a dividing line between the superior and inferior lobes on both sides and the horizontal fissure divides the superior lobe from the middle lobe and it is only found on the right side because only the right side has a middle lobe. Some other differences between the two lungs is that the right lung is wider or broader because the left lung has to have a place for the heart to fit since the heart sits slightly left to the midline. The left lung, however, is longer because the right lung uh, has to share space with the liver, and so it can't descend as far. And the left lung has a cardiac notch in it, which is where the heart sits, because again, the heart is slightly left to the midline. So the hilum is the area where the main bronchus and the pulmonary arteries enter the lungs and the area where the pulmonary veins exit the lungs. And again, remember, pulmonary arteries are shown in blue, pulmonary veins are shown in red.
The hilum is also where nerves and lymphatics pass in and out. And I mentioned this in a previous lecture, but a lot of organs have a hilum, which is an area where all of these large vessels go in and out of the organ. The base of the lung is the broadest area, and in this case, it is at the bottom, unlike the base of the heart, which was at the top. And the apex is the pointy, most narrow area, and in this case, it is at the top. So the blood supply to the lungs actually includes both circuits, the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. And if you forgot these circuits, please go back and review them in chapter 20. So the pulmonary circuit is responsible for supplying blood to the alveoli. So deoxygenated blood comes in through the pulmonary arteries. Oxygenation takes place through gas exchange at the alveoli. And then the oxygenated blood leaves through the pulmonary veins. So the pulmonary arteries are colored blue because they're carrying deoxygenated blood and the pulmonary veins are red because they are carrying oxygenated blood. The endothelial cells of the capillaries that surround the alveoli also produce an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE. And we talked about this in the cardiovascular system chapters. This enzyme converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 and angiotensin 2 plays a role in maintaining blood volume and pressure. The pulmonary circuit has a lower blood pressure in it than the systemic circuit, but since the blood pressure is lower, pulmonary vessels are easier to block with clots. And so a pulmonary embolism is the blockage of blood flow to a group of lobules or alveoli within the lungs. If the blockage is not cleared quickly, it can cause a permanent collapse of the affected alveoli. And if the blockage happens in a major vessel, so like a major branch of the pulmonary artery instead of a smaller branch, it can increase the resistance um, and put a strain on the right side of the heart. And again, if left untreated, this can lead to right-sided congestive heart failure. So the blood supply to the lungs also includes part of the systemic circuit. So keep in mind the pulmonary circuit is only delivering blood to the alveoli for the purpose of oxygenation. But there are cells in the lungs other than the alveoli. There are cells that make up the trachea, the bronchi, and the bronchioles, and then all of the connective tissue between all of these different passageways. And so all of these cells get their blood from the systemic circuit and these come into the lungs through the bronchial arteries, which is a branch of the thoracic aorta. So the systemic circuit is supplying oxygen nutrients to the cells that are lining the passageway. So think of the cells that are lining the trachea, the bronchi, and the bronchioles. And we talked about like all of those little mucus glands and mucus cells, they're gonna need a blood supply. So the systemic circuit is doing its normal job of supplying oxygen and nutrients to cells. The focus of the pulmonary circuit is to just get blood to the alveoli so it can be oxygenated. So each lung sits in a pleural cavity. So you have two pleural cavities, one on either side of the mediastinum. And the lungs are surrounded by two pleural membranes and the pleural membranes are a type of serous membrane. So first there is the parietal pleura, which lines the inner surface of the thoracic wall. So over here in this little close up image, you can see a muscle, you can see part of a rib. And so this would be uh, the thoracic cavity wall. And so the parietal pleura is gonna be the membrane that lines the thoracic wall. The visceral pleura is gonna be the membrane that actually sits on the outer surface of the lung. And then between these two membranes, you have a space called the pleural cavity. This is also called the intrapleural space. And later we'll be talking about intrapleural pressures. So remember, intrapleural means between the two pleural membranes. So both pleural membranes secrete fluid, and we call this the pleural fluid, and this is the fluid that fills this cavity or space between the two membranes.
This fluid lubricates and reduces friction between the two membranes, and it also helps keep the two membranes stuck together in a fluid bond that becomes important for the function of lungs that we'll talk about later. So thoracentesis is a procedure used to obtain a sample of pleural fluid by using a long needle that is inserted through the ribs into the pleural cavity. And pleurisy is pain and inflammation that results from an increase in friction between the pleural membranes because something is blocking or interfering with the production of the pleural fluid. And with pleurisy, the breathing becomes very painful because every time you inhale and exhale, you actually feel those two membranes rubbing up against each other and it's very painful. So now that we've covered the anatomy, it's time to turn to the physiology. And we're going to start with an overview of respiration. So the process of respiration involves two integrated processes. The first one is called external respiration, and this is all processes involved in the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the body's fluids and the external environment. The external respiration is the main function of the respiratory system as we discussed earlier. Internal respiration is the absorption and use of oxygen and release of carbon dioxide by the mitochondria of individual cells of the body. This is also known as cellular respiration or aerobic respiration. So to summarize, respiration is a combination of external respiration, which is getting the oxygen and CO2 into the body and then to the tissues. And then internal respiration is the process of the tissues and cells themselves using the oxygen and releasing the CO2. So for the rest of this chapter, we are only going to focus on external respiration. Internal respiration, also known as cellular respiration, was covered in Chapter 3, and we briefly reviewed it at the beginning of this lecture. So there are three integrated steps in external respiration. The first one is pulmonary ventilation, which can also just be called breathing. This is the physical movement of air into and out of the lungs and ultimately into the alveoli. Then we have gas diffusion or gas exchange, and this is the movement of gases between the air and blood and between the blood and tissues. And the third step is gas transport. This is the transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide from the alveolar capillaries to the systemic capillary beds. So if we look at this picture again, the pulmonary ventilation portion is getting the air into and out of the lungs, so the physical movement of the air into and out of the system. Then we have the process of gas diffusion in the alveoli, where gas is diffusing from the air into the blood. Then you have the transport of the gases in the blood, and then when the blood reaches the capillaries out in the uh, tissues, you have gas diffusion again between the blood and the interstitial fluids. So anything that affects any of those three steps involved in external respiration can affect the concentration of gases in the interstitial fluids. So hypoxia is a condition of low oxygen levels in the tissue. This places a severe limit on the affected cell's metabolic activities because remember, oxygen is being used by the mitochondria to make ATP. So if a cell has insufficient oxygen, they can't make enough ATP to maintain all the normal metabolic activities. Anoxia is a complete lack of oxygen to tissues, and this results in cell death very quickly. So here's a little uh, illustration for you. So the condition of normoxia would be normal oxygen levels and all the cells are happy, shown by green. Hypoxia would be a reduction in delivery of oxygen to the tissues and some of the cells are going to become hypoxic, which means that their uh, functions are going to be limited. And then in the case of anoxia, which is in a complete absence of oxygen, you start getting uh, cell death, which is shown by the red circles.
Most of the damage done to the heart muscle during heart attacks and to the brain during strokes is actually a result of local anoxia when those cells have a complete uh, cutoff of their oxygen supply. So before we can proceed, we need a brief introduction to airflow and a quick discussion about the relationship between pressure and volume. So the atmospheric pressure is the weight of the molecules in the Earth's atmosphere. And so the closer you are to sea level, the higher the pressure of the uh, molecules in the atmosphere because you have more of them pushing downward. And you've probably heard that if you go up to high altitudes, you have low oxygen levels. Well, that's because at high altitudes, you have a lower atmospheric pressure. So the air molecules are farther apart, and that's why there is low oxygen at high altitudes. So we're going to focus on the atmospheric pressure at sea level. And at sea level, normal atmospheric pressure is measured as uh, equivalent to the uh, unit of one atmosphere. And then, like we looked at blood pressure in millimeters mercury, we're also going to look at pressures of uh, the air inside the respiratory system by using millimeters mercury as well. So we need to remember that one atmosphere, or the pressure of the atmosphere at sea level, is equivalent to 760 millimeters mercury. So air flows from high pressure to low pressure. So think of air as always moving from areas of high to low pressure, just like blood flow did. So blood flow also moved from areas of high to low pressure. So does air. And in fact, if you've ever wondered what makes wind, when we have areas of high pressure in the atmosphere and areas of low pressure, the uh, air wants to move from the high to the low area, and that's how we end up getting wind. So why do we care about pressures in the respiratory system? Well, it turns out that air moves into and out of the respiratory tract entirely due to pressure gradients. So differences in pressure and the air moving from a high pressure area to a low pressure is actually the underlying principles behind how we breathe. So we also need to discuss Boyle's Law. And Boyle's law states that gas pressure is inversely proportional to volume. So mathematically, that says pressure equals 1 over volume. But the important uh, thing to remember is that they're inversely proportional, which means when one goes up, the other one goes down. So when we enclose a gas in an enclosed area like a container, the pressure of the gas in that enclosed area is actually determined by the air molecules bumping into the sides of the container. So if you look over here on the left, let's say we've got this little uh, container square box. And so the pressure inside this container is a measure of how often these air molecules collide with the sides of the box. So if I decrease the volume, and I keep the amount of gas in there the same, but I decrease the volume, I'm going to have more collisions because the walls are closer together. I have the same number of air molecules. So because there's less space in here, they're going to hit the sides more. And because they're hitting the sides more, that is what we call a higher pressure. So a smaller volume is going to equal a higher gas pressure. Conversely, if I raise the volume, so I take this box here on the left and I increase it and I make it larger, but I still have the same number of air molecules. Now, because the box is larger, they're going to hit up against the sides less often. So there are decreased collisions with the sides of the box, and that's going to be measured as a lower pressure. So the take home message to remember is that if you decrease the volume, you increase the pressure. And conversely, if you increase the volume, you decrease the pressure. So now we will look at pulmonary ventilation and the volume changes in pressure gradients inside the respiratory tract and also the respiratory muscles. So breathing involves pressure changes which occur due to volume changes inside the lungs. And then as we just discussed, air will flow from areas of high pressure to low pressure.
So the respiratory cycle is one cycle of inspiration, which is also called inhalation, and expiration, which is also called exhalation. I know it can be confusing because we have a more common term uh, for the word inspiration and expiration, but when you see these two terms in relation to the uh, respiratory system, inspiration means inhalation and expiration means exhalation. So as a reminder, we have these two pleural membranes. We have the visceral pleura that lines the lungs and the parietal pleura which lines the thoracic wall and they are separated by pleural fluid that exists within the pleural cavity. And so these two membranes are connected by a fluid bond, which means those two membranes are stuck together by the presence of that fluid. Therefore, when we change the volume of the thoracic cavity, the parietal pleura, which is attached to, to the thoracic cavity, will move, and because of this fluid bond, it will pull or suck the visceral pleura with it so that therefore when the volume of the thoracic cavity changes, the volume of the lungs will also change. Also note that at rest, so like if you're holding your breath or you're currently not breathe, uh, breathing, the pressure inside the lungs, represented by P inside, is equal to the pressure outside of the lungs in the atmosphere, which is represented by P outside. So since the two pressures are equal, there is no movement of air. So we would say P outside equals P inside. And um, in this case and in the upcoming cases, the P in these examples is also called intrapulmonary pressure, so the pressure inside the lungs. It can also be called the intraalveolar pressure because we're specifically talking about the pressure inside the alveoli. So let's talk for a moment about the primary respiratory muscles. These are two muscles that are always involved in inhalation and they are the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. So at rest, the diaphragm forms a dome shape, which is shown here in this image, and it projects superiorly into the thoracic cavity. So when the diaphragm contracts, as you can see in this image, it goes from this dome shape to the, where this dotted line is, it's going to flatten the diaphragm and move it in an inferior direction. And that is going to result in an increase in the thoracic cavity volume. When the external intercostals contract, they pull the ribs upward and outward, which is a superior and anterior movement. And this is also going to result in an increase in the thoracic cavity volume. So the ribs and the sternum will be elevated. You can also think of this like a handle on a bucket when you raise it up you're actually increasing uh, that area that is encompassed by that handle. So the primary respiratory muscles, which we just said were the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles, are used during every respiratory cycle. So the diaphragm and the external intercostals are used every time you breathe, but you, and they are also only used for inhalation. So they are only used to inhale air. They actually relax during exhalation, as we'll talk about in a moment. You do also have accessory respiratory muscles, and those are shown here in this image under the two headings on the left and right that say accessory uh, respiratory muscles. They are only used when the depth and frequency of breathing must be greatly increased, like during exercise, for example, when you're breathing uh, more deeply and more heavily. And the accessory respiratory muscles are used for both deep inhalation and deep exhalation. And we have enough to go over in this chapter, so I'm not actually going to test you on the names of the different accessory respiratory muscles. Just know that they are used to make the uh, depth and rate of breathing increase when needed. So the important take-home point with the movement and contraction of the muscles is that contraction of the respiratory muscles is going to change the volume of the thoracic cavity. 
And as we just discussed earlier, volume changes are going to change the pressure of the air inside the cavity. And then air will then move from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So let's see what happens during inhalation, which is also called inspiration. So during inhalation, you have contraction of muscles that will increase the volume of the thoracic cavity. So remember, the diaphragm is going to move down, and the external intercostal muscles are going to pull the rib cage and the sternum up and out. And that is going to increase the volume of the thoracic cavity. Inhalation is always active, meaning it always is going to require muscle contraction. At rest, it will just be the external intercostal muscles in the diaphragm. But then like during exercise or more strenuous breathing, you will involve the accessory respiratory muscles. So since we increased the volume, we get a decrease in pressure. Remember, volume and pressure are inversely proportional. So the increase in volume causes a decrease in pressure inside the thoracic cavity. So we can represent that by saying the pressure outside is now greater than the pressure inside because we decrease the pressure inside by increasing the volume. And as a reminder again, this P represents the intrapulmonary pressure. And again, air wants to move from an area of high pressure to low pressure. So now since the low pressure is on the inside, air will move into the lungs. And then if we look at exhalation, which is also called expiration, this involves either a relaxation of muscles or a contraction of muscles, but either way we are going to decrease the volume of the thoracic cavity. So at rest, it's just going to be the relaxation of the diaphragm and the external intercostals, but during heavier breathing, you can actually contract additional accessory respiratory muscles during exhalation. So exhalation can be passive, meaning it only involves muscle relaxation, or it can be active, meaning it requires muscle contraction. So again, we decreased the volume, and because we decreased the volume, we cause an increase in pressure inside the thoracic cavity. So now the pressure inside the thoracic cavity is greater than the pressure outside. And again, this P represents the intrapulmonary pressure. And so again, air moves from an area of high pressure to low pressure. Now the high pressure is inside, the low pressure is outside. So air is going to move out of the lungs. So breathing is all about volume changes, which lead to pressure changes, which leads to changes in the direction air flows. So inhalation, again, is always an active process. The contraction of the diaphragm will flatten the floor of the thoracic cavity, and this accounts for 75% of the thoracic cavity volume change at rest and the contraction of the external intercostal muscles will raise the ribs and the sternum, and this accounts for 25% of the thoracic cavity volume change during rest. And then the accessory muscles can increase the speed and amount of rib movement when needed. Exhalation can be active or passive. During rest, so normal quiet breathing, it is a passive process in which the diaphragm and external intercostals relax, returning the thoracic cavity back to the original volume. You also have elastic rebound of those elastic fibers that wrap around the alveoli, which also helps to push air out of the lungs during exhalation. And then there is also active exhalation where your accessory muscles can help to depress the ribs and compress the abdomen to forcefully exhale more air when needed. So like for example, if you just stop and try to force all of the air out of your lungs as much as you can, you would be using your accessory muscles. Now we'll take a closer look at the pressure gradients and look at some graphs and also talk about the difference between intrapulmonary pressure and intrapleural pressure. So intrapulmonary pressure, which is also called intraalveolar pressure, 
is the pressure inside the respiratory tract, specifically inside the alveoli. As we discussed in the previous section, the intrapulmonary pressure can be greater or less than the atmospheric pressure. And this determines the direction of the airflow. So the P outside would be the atmospheric pressure and P inside would be the pressure inside the alveoli or the intrapulmonary pressure. So as discussed before, if the pressure inside is lower, air moves into the lungs. And if the pressure inside is higher, air moves out of the lungs. But there is also an intrapleural pressure. This is the pressure inside the pleural cavity between the two pleural membranes. The intrapleural pressure, in contrast to the intrapulmonary pressure, should always be negative or less than the atmospheric pressure. Negative pressure is what causes suction. So the two membranes should be stuck together with this fluid bond by the negative pressure so that when the volume of the uh, thoracic cavity changes, that will also allow the volume of the lungs to change. So remember, one membrane is stuck to the thoracic cavity, that's the parietal pleura. The other membrane is stuck to the lung, that is the visceral pleura. So we want the two membranes to be stuck together through suction so that they both move at the same time. So here's a graph showing you intrapulmonary pressure. So again, this is the pressure inside the tract and the alveoli. So if we take a look at this graph of the intrapulmonary pressure changes, the zero represents when the pressure inside is equal to the pressure outside. So this means the pressure inside the lungs would be the same as the atmospheric pressure. And then notice that during inhalation, the pressure inside is lower and so that's why we have a negative pressure here. And so because it's lower, air moves into the lungs and that causes inhalation. And then over here, notice that during exhalation, the pressure inside becomes greater or plus one, higher than the atmospheric pressure. And so that is going to force air out of the lungs and that is exhalation. Now let's take a look at this graph, and this graph is showing the intrapleural pressure, which is the pressure in the cavity between the two membranes. So notice that even though the intrapleural pressure changes when you inhale and exhale, it is always negative, so it is always less than the atmospheric pressure, as you can tell by the y-axis over here. So this is important, uh, and we can see why when we see uh, why it, what happens when it breaks. So a pneumothorax is a condition where air enters the pleural cavity, and it breaks the fluid bond between the two pleural membranes. And air can get into the pleural cavity either through an in injury to the chest wall, like a stabbing or during an accident, like a car accident, something punctures the chest wall, or you can also have the rupture of an alveoli that breaks through the visceral pleura, which allows air to go from inside the lung into the pleural cavity. In either case, we have air coming into the pleural cavity, and this is going to break the fluid bond between the visceral and parietal pleura. So once that fluid bond is broken, the intrapleural pressure then becomes equal to the outside pressure, so it would go up to zero. That means we have no negative pressure, which means we have no suction that exists anymore. And without the negative pressure holding those two membranes together, the lung no longer moves along with the thoracic cavity. So now if you increase the volume of the thoracic cavity, the parietal pleural membrane will go with it, but because it's no longer stuck to the visceral pleural membrane, the lung will just sit there and it won't move. And this results in atelectasis, which is a collapsed lung. So the lung stays deflated and can increase in volume because of that broken fluid bond. And so the lung is no longer moving along with the volume changes in the thoracic cavity. In this section, we'll look at the different types or patterns of breathing and factors that affect pulmonary ventilation. So quiet breathing or eupnea 
is the normal breathing that you do while at rest. So for adults, the normal breathing rate is between 12 and 18 breaths per minute, and children have a higher breathing rate at 18 to 20 breaths per minute. Inhalation requires muscular contraction of the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. Exhalation is passive, meaning it only involves muscle relaxation, so the diaphragm and external intercostals are relaxing to allow you to exhale. Now there are some variations of the quiet breathing. Diaphragmatic breathing or deep breathing, you have more reliance on the diaphragm, and this is the normal condition, as we mentioned before, under normal rest conditions, the diaphragm accounts for 75% of the thoracic cavity volume change. But in some cases, when the diaphragm is limited in its ability to move, you can switch to costal breathing or shallow breathing, and this is more reliance on the external intercostal muscles. For example, during pregnancy, when you have increased abdominal pressure from an enlarging uterus, you can have to switch to shallow breathing because your diaphragm is not able to move as much. So in contrast to quiet breathing, there is also forced breathing or hypnea. This is faster, deeper breathing like what you do, for example, when you're exercising. So the inhalation and exhalation are both active and they not only involve the diaphragm and external intercostals, but they also have reliance on those accessory muscles. So now let's look at the factors that affect pulmonary ventilation. The first factor is the resistance to airflow, and the resistance is primarily controlled by the diameter of the bronchioles, and we discussed that early, earlier when we talked about bronchodilation and bronchoconstriction. Another factor that affects ventilation is compliance. Compliance is a measure of the expandability of the lungs. In other words, how easy it is to expand the lung volume. So a high compliance means the lungs are easy to expand and low compliance means the lungs are hard to expand. So as compliance decreases, more energy is required to breathe and if the energy required to breathe becomes too much, that can quickly lead to exhaustion. So there are two main types of lung diseases. With obstructive lung diseases, these are diseases that increase the resistance to airflow, so it's changing the resistance. And with restrictive lung diseases, these are diseases that decrease the compliance of the lungs so you're changing the ability of the lungs to expand. And we'll talk a little bit more about the difference between these two types of diseases in the activity for this chapter. So there are three main factors that affect compliance, and the first of these is the connective tissue within the lungs. For example, you have those elastic fibers that wrap around each of the alveoli, and in the case of like emphysema, you have the destruction and damage of the alveolar surfaces, which include a loss of elastic fibers. So in this case, as the tissue is lost, compliance actually increases, meaning the lungs can expand more easily because they're no longer fighting against these elastic bands. And so the lungs can end up hyperexpanding and causing a barrel chested appearance. So one of the um, hallmarks of having emphysema is having this barrel chested appearance from the lungs being able to hyper expand. Another thing that can affect compliance is surfactant production. So as we discussed earlier, insufficient surfactant makes the alveoli collapse every time you exhale. And this requires extra force to reinflate the lungs when you inhale and that would be an example of decreased compliance. So that respiratory distress syndrome we talked about earlier would be a type of restrictive lung disease. And the third factor that affects compliance is the mobility of the thoracic cage. So arthritis and other musculoskeletal disorders can affect the movement of the ribs, 
And if you have decreased mobility or ability for your thoracic cage to move, that's going to reduce your ability to change that volume, which is going to result in decreased compliance. So we'll finish up our talk on pulmonary ventilation by looking at respiratory capacities and volumes and a spirometry graph. So when we're measuring the respiratory function, we might look at the respiratory rate, which is the number of breaths taken each minute. We might also look at respiratory volumes, which are measurable volumes of air that can move in and out of the lungs. And we can look at respiratory capacities, which are calculated by adding together different types of volumes. So there are sex differences in volumes and capacities because women tend to have smaller bodies and therefore smaller lungs. A spirometer is an instrument that we use to measure the lung volumes. And here is an image of a person who is using a spirometer. So you have to like inhale as much as you can and exhale as much as you can and the machine records the results and we'll look at a uh, result graph in just a moment. And the spirometry can help with diagnosing certain ventilation problems. So here is a spirometry graph and the graph is showing the volumes and capacities for an adult male but the only actual numbers we're going to look at is the ones for tidal volume and so we're not going to really uh, look at the exact numbers for the other volumes and capacities. So the tidal volume, abbreviated VT, is the volume of air moved in and out of the lungs during one normal quiet respiratory cycle. So think of it as just a normal breathe, uh, breath in and a normal breath out and it's shown right here in the center of the graph. And the tidal volume averages 500 milliliters in both men and women. So the expiratory reserve volume, or ERV, is the amount of air that can be forcefully expelled after a normal quiet respiratory cycle. So imagine just trying to exhale as much air as possible. And so the expiratory reserve volume is going to go from the bottom of the tidal volume to the bottom trough shown down here. So from the bottom of the tidal volume to the lowest most point of the line on the graph, that is the ERV. The inspiratory reserve volume, or IRV, is the amount of air that can be forcefully inhaled over and above the tidal volume. So think about taking a deep breath and trying to inhale as much as possible. That's how you would measure your IRV. So it's going to run from the top of the tidal volume to wherever the highest peak is on the graph, and that would be your inspiratory reserve volume. The residual volume is how much air is remaining in your lungs even after you have maximally exhaled as much air as you can. So even after a forceful exhalation, there is still going to be air trapped in all of those bronchioles and all of those um, little alveolar ducts and sacs, and so you can never exhale all of the air out of your lungs. And so the residual volume is shown on the graph from the bottommost uh, valley on the graph to the bottom of the graph. So in this particular individual, their residual volume would be 1,200 milliliters, which is 1.2 liters. Now there is also a minimal volume, which is how much air is left in your lungs even if a lung collapses. So even with a collapsed lung, you cannot get rid of all of the air, and so that is called the minimal volume, and that is shown here. This can't actually be measured on a spirometry graph because you can't go around collapsing people's lungs. So now we'll look at the respiratory capacities. And again, remember the difference between a volume and a capacity is that a capacity is going to be a sum of multiple volumes. So first we have the inspiratory capacity, which is the total amount of air that you can inhale. So it's going to be a sum of the IRV and the tidal volume. So you can see that line here. And you can see it goes through the white area in the middle and the purple area at the top. So it's the, I, the uh, IRV plus the tidal volume. The vital capacity is the maximum amount of air that can be moved into and out of the lungs. And this is going to be a sum of the IRV plus the tidal volume plus the ERV.
So basically from the highest peak on the graph to the lowest valley on the graph, and that represents the maximum amount of air that can be moved into and out of the lungs. The total lung capacity is the total amount of air that can fit in the lungs. So this would be both the vital capacity, how much you can move in and out, plus the residual volume, that bit that is always left behind. So that would represent the total lung capacity, which basically goes from the top of the graph all the way to the bottom of the graph. And then you have your functional residual capacity, or FRC, which is the amount of air normally remaining in your lungs after a normal, quiet respiratory cycle. So think about when you're just breathing every day. Every now and then you might take a deep breath in, like a sigh. So you're going to have your IRV every now and then. But you very seldom go around trying to forcefully exhale air. So on a functional day-to-day -day basis, the residual capacity or the air that stays in your lungs is actually a sum of the ERV plus the residual volume because you're not really going around expe expelling as much air as you can, so you're not really using that expiratory reserve volume. So the functional day-to-day -day residual capacity would be the ERV plus the residual volume. So now we'll talk about gas exchange and the diffusion of gases. So first we need a little bit of background information on gases. So the air that we breathe, so our atmosphere, is made up of 78.6% nitrogen gas, 20.9% oxygen gas, a very small amount of carbon dioxide, 0.04%, and then the rest of it is water vapor. So Dalton's Law says that each gas contributes to the total pressure in proportion to its abundance. So as we mentioned earlier, the atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters mercury. So because oxygen makes up about 21% of the atmosphere, that means that oxygen is contributing to 21% of the pressure that we find in the atmosphere. So basically Dalton's Law is saying that if you add up the partial pressure of the nitrogen, the partial pressure of the oxygen, the partial pressure of the water vapor, and the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide, all four of those will add up to equal 760 millimeters mercury. So since water is, I mean not water, since its oxygen is 21% of the atmosphere, it is 21% of the 760, so the partial pressure of oxygen and air is 159 millimeters mercury. Henry's Law says that the amount of gas in a solution is proportional to its partial pressure. So if you have an increased pressure, you can force more molecules to go into a solution. And if you have a decreased pressure, more molecules will come out of the solution. And your textbook uses the example of how they force carbon dioxide into sodas uh, to make carbonated beverages. And then when you open your can of carbonated beverages, you release that pressure and it causes the gas to come out of the solution, which is the bubbles that come up. And then if you leave it sitting around long enough, all the gas comes out and your soda goes flat. So you can read that in your textbook if you want to get some more background information. Uh, the solubility of the gas is also going to affect how much of it is going to go into a solution. And in our bodies, uh, carbon dioxide is the most soluble, followed by oxygen, and nitrogen gas has very little solubility uh, in our body fluids. So you might be saying, Dr. Sawyer, I suddenly feel like I'm in a chemistry class instead of an AMP class. What does this have to do with this chapter? So the take home message, a gas's ability to diffuse into and out of the blood is going to depend on pressure gradients. So air that reaches the alveoli is mixed with air from a previous respiratory cycle. So remember we talked about how your lungs have that residual volume of air that is never, you're never able to completely exhale. So when you inhale fresh air, it's actually mixing with that old air that is still in your lungs. So the air that is in the alveoli actually has more carbon dioxide and less oxygen in it than the atmospheric air because you're mixing atmospheric air with air that is staying that stayed behind in the lungs. So here is a graph from your textbook and this allows you to compare the different partial pressures of the different types of gases uh, in inhaled air 
versus air that is in the alveolus versus air after you exhale it. But the numbers that we want to pay attention to is that in the alveoli, the partial pressure of oxygen is 100 millimeters mercury, and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 40 millimeters mercury. So these two numbers right here, the oxygen carbon dioxide numbers in the alveoli. So in fact, here are all the important numbers for you to remember for this section of this chapter. So the pressures in the alveoli and in the oxygenated blood, the pressure of oxygen will be between 95 and 100 millimeters mercury. The pressure of the CO2 will be 40 millimeters mercury. And the pressures in the tissues and in deoxygenated blood, the pressure of oxygen would be 40 millimeters mercury and the pressure of carbon dioxide will be 45 millimeters mercury. So gas exchange occurs at the blood air barrier, which is the respiratory membrane that has those three different layers we talked about earlier. And exchange at the blood air barrier is very efficient for five reasons. The first is that there is a substantial difference in partial pressures across this membrane. And the larger the difference is between two partial pressures, the faster the diffusion. And so this applies even when we're talking about the diffusion of solutes in AMP1. The larger the concentration gradient, the faster the diffusion. Well, the same thing happens with gases. The larger the difference in pressures, the faster the diffusion will occur. So when you go up to high altitudes, like people who climb Mount Everest, for example, when the oxygen pressures in the atmosphere are reduced, then there's not so much of a difference between the pressures on the inside and the outside, so you have a reduced difference in partial pressures. So your gas exchange isn't as efficient, and this is why people exposed to high altitudes can end up getting hypoxia. The second reason the blood air barrier exchange is efficient is that very short distances are involved. So if you go back and review our description of the blood air barrier, remember we said it was only 0.5 micrometers thick, so that is a very short distance. And inflammation or fluid can increase this distance, which would reduce efficiency, like we talked about when we talked about pneumonia, adding fluid into the alveoli. Also, the exchange is efficient because gases are lipid soluble. So oxygen and carbon dioxide can go straight through the plasma membrane of the endothelial cells and the alveolar cells. And so that you don't have to wait on them to go through channels or to use transport proteins. So that also uh, increases the efficiency. The total surface area for gas exchange is very large. So remember, you have all of those millions of alveoli in your lungs. So if you were to take that surface area and stretch, stretch it all out to see just how much surface it is, it would actually stretch over half a ten tennis court, and it's 35 times larger than your body's surface area. So that's a lot of surface area packed into all those little alveoli in your lungs. So tissue damage, like which happens with emphysema, um, can reduce the available surface area, and so reducing the available surface area is going to reduce the efficiency of the gas exchange. And then the fifth reason is that blood flow and airflow are coordinated. So blood that has the lowest oxygen levels is sent to the alveoli that has the highest oxygen levels. So in this way, the blood flow into the lungs and the airflow are coordinated so that you can get oxygen into the blood very quickly. And if you have a blockage in your blood flow, like with pulmonary embolism, this can disrupt this coordination between the blood flow and airflow. So if we take a look at the gas exchange in the lungs, so we're looking at the pulmonary capillaries or the alveolar capillaries, so deoxygenated blood is coming into the lungs, and in the deoxygenated blood, notice that our oxygen pressure is 40 millimeters mercury, and our carbon dioxide pressure is 45 millimeters mercury, and that is the gas pressure in the deoxygenated blood coming into the lungs. Then once the blood is in the pulmonary capillaries, we have gas exchange, which is going to equalize the pressures in the blood to match the pressures in the alveoli. So if you look in the alveolus here, 
our partial pressures of oxygen is 100, carbon dioxide is 40. So by the time the blood leaves the capillary, the pressures inside the blood is going to match the pressures that were inside the alveolus. So our oxygen pressure went up to 100, our carbon dioxide pressure went down to 40. So that's another number to remember. The oxygen pressure in the oxygenated blood leaves at 100 millimeters mercury, carbon dioxide at 40 millimeters mercury. So after leaving the lungs, the value of the oxygen drops slightly to 95 millimeters mercury, which is why in that previous uh, numbers to remember, I told you 95 to 100 millimeters mercury. So the diffusion happens very rapidly at these capillaries for all the reasons that we just talked about, those five reasons that diffusion is efficient. And to give you an idea of how fast this occurs, at a normal heart rate, so at rest, a blood cell only spends 0.75 seconds inside an alveolar capillary, so less than a second in the capillary. And then when you're exercising and you have an increased heart rate, a blood cell might only spend 0.3 seconds inside one of these capillaries, but in both cases, this is enough time for the gas pressures to still equalize between the gas pressures in the blood and the gas pressures in the alveoli. So if we take a look at gas exchange in the tissues, coming into the tissues, we have oxygenated blood, where the partial pressure of oxygen is 95 millimeters mercury, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 40 millimeters mercury, so very close to the way it was when it left the lungs. And this is how the blood is when it arrives at a systemic capillary. Then you're gonna have gas exchange that is going to equalize the pressures in the blood that will match the pressures in the interstitial fluids in the tissues. So notice that the pressures in the interstitial fluids are 40 for oxygen and 45 for CO2. So very quickly in the capillaries, the oxygen will leave and go into the tissues. The CO2 will come into the blood. And so the deoxygenated blood that is leaving out the other side will now match these numbers that are in the tissues. So 40 millimeters mercury for oxygen, 45 millimeters mercury for carbon dioxide. In this section, we're going to look at the oxygen transport in the blood and also talk about hemoglobin saturation and saturation curves. So the transport of oxygen, and we're going to briefly mention carbon dioxide here and then talk about it in more detail later on. But if we just had plasma in our blood and no red blood cells, there is actually a limited ability of oxygen and carbon dioxide to dissolve in the plasma. So they have a limited solubility. And so it is for this reason that we have red blood cells. Red blood cells are able to remove the oxygen and the carbon dioxide from the plasma so that the blood can carry more of both gases than if our blood was just liquid and didn't have the red blood cells. So having the red blood cells bypasses the problem of, ha of these gases having a limited solubility in plasma. And so this is uh, most easily seen if we look at the numbers. So if we did not have red blood cells and all we had was the liquid portion of the blood, the plasma, 100 milliliters of plasma would only be able to absorb and contain 0.3 milliliters of oxygen. But with the red blood cells, 100 milliliters of blood can hold 20 milliliters of oxygen. So the red blood cells give the blood the higher ability to transport these gases. So these reactions are reversible. So when the plasma concentrations are high of either oxygen or carbon dioxide, there is an increased uptake of those gases by the red blood cells. So you can think of the red blood cells acting as a means to temporarily store these gases. And then when you have low plasma concentrations of oxygen and carbon dioxide, the red blood cells can release the gases they're holding on to. So this would be a case of the release of the stored gases from the red blood cells. So now let's look specifically at oxygen transport. And oxygen binds to hemoglobin inside the red blood cells for transport in the blood. And we talked about the hemoglobin structure in the cardiovascular system. It has four protein subunits. Each subunit has a heme group. And inside each heme group is an iron.
and the oxygen molecules are actually attracted to the iron part of the heme group. So when hemoglobin, which is abbreviated HB, binds to oxygen, this actually forms oxyhemoglobin or HBO2. Each hemoglobin can bind to four oxygen molecules. One red blood cell has about 280 million hemoglobin molecules. Each hemoglobin molecule can hold four oxygens. So one red blood cell can hold more than one billion oxygen molecules. And then go back and think about how many red blood cells we have. So that is an ability to carry a lot of oxygen in our blood. So hemoglobin saturation is the percentage of heme units that are bound to oxygen at any given moment. So if you were to say hemoglobin is 100% saturated, you would be saying that hemoglobin is bound to four oxygen molecules. So it has a spot for four, all four are binding to oxygen, so it would be 100% saturated. If we were to say it was 50% saturated, then hemoglobin is only bound to two oxygen molecules, and the other two hemes would be empty. So you can also have 75% saturation where it's bound to three, and 25% saturation where it's only bound to one oxygen. So saturation curves can show us how the hemoglobin saturation can change under certain conditions. And so we're gonna look over the next couple of slides about these uh, different conditions in detail, but to sum it up, the saturation curves can change with the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood, also with the blood pH levels, the blood temperature, the actual metabolism that goes on inside the red blood cells, and then there are different versions of hemoglobin, so there is a fetal hemoglobin and an adult form of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin molecules will actually change shape slightly every time a molecule of oxygen binds, which changes its affinity for binding to more oxygen molecules. And so without going into great detail into the biochemistry behind this, suffice it to say that because the binding of oxygen causes the affinity of hemoglobin to change, when we look at saturation curves, they are always curves. That's why we call these graphs saturation curves. So it's not a straight line. When reading these graphs, notice that at the bottom, you'll find the partial pressure of oxygen in millimeters mercury. And then on the left axis will actually be the percentage of saturation. So again, 100% would mean that four hemoglobin are bound, 75% would mean three, 50 would mean two, 25% would mean one oxygen is bound, and then zero would mean no oxygens are bound. And so notice that sometimes you can get funky percentages. So just keep in mind that this is an average of all of the hemoglobins. So if you look at an individual hemoglobin, you can only have zero, 25, 50, 75, or 100% saturation because there's only four spots that oxygen can bind to. But we get some of these uh, funky percentages because again, this is an average of all of the hemoglobins in the blood at these specific uh, conditions. So let's take a closer look at the hemoglobin saturation and see how it relates to oxygen levels. So what this graph is showing you is that as the partial pressure of oxygen increases, the hemoglobin is binding to more oxygen. So at very high levels of uh, oxygen pressure, you're going to approach 100% saturation of the hemoglobin. So in the alveoli, where the partial pressure of oxygen is 100 millimeters mercury, the hemoglobin gets almost completely saturated. So again, this is an average, and that's why it never actually reaches 100. But for all intents and purposes, you can say that most of the hemoglobin molecules at this point are going to be bound to four oxygens. So the number is actually very close to 100%. Now let's look at what happens. So the red blood cells then go out into our tissues. And as we discussed earlier, the partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues is 40 millimeters mercury. So at this partial pressure, we can see that the hemoglobin is about 75% saturated. And so that means that at this point, the hemoglobin is still bound to three oxygen molecules. 
So technically, when the blood cells go from the lungs out to our tissues, when they get to the tissues, they're only letting go of one oxygen molecule. They're still holding on to three oxygen molecules. So even though we talk about blood being deoxygenated, technically it's not completely deoxygenated. It still has a large oxygen reserve that can be released uh, in times of emergency. And so to give you an example, let's say that you're exercising. So you've got a muscle that's really working hard, and that muscle is using up extra oxygen. So in those capillaries, the P oxygen levels are going to go very low. And so notice that when they go really low, now hemoglobin is releasing much more of its oxygen. So at these very low levels, hemoglobin molecules are going, only going to have an average of about one oxygen molecule per hemoglobin. So this shows you that, um, that under normal conditions, the hemoglobin can actually still hold on to a lot of oxygen that it can release when oxygen levels get really low. So now let's see how the saturation curve changes with the pH. And as a reminder, pH is a measure of hydrogen ion concentration. More hydrogen ion concentration means a lower pH. And we're going to go into detail, great detail about pH uh, in chapter 27 later on the semester. So for now, we're going to give you a brief introduction. pH in the body is primarily affected by carbon dioxide levels. So in the blood, specifically inside red blood cells, carbon dioxide reacts with water. And there's an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase that converts it to carbonic acid. And the carbonic acid then can dissociate into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. You're going to see this equation many times between now and the end of the semester. So go ahead and learn it and go ahead and get it in your memory. And so because carbon dioxide, if we shift this equation to the right, because carbon dioxide can be converted into hydrogen ions, and hydrogen ions is what causes pH to become lower, this means that carbon dioxide will result in a decrease in pH. So hydrogen ions are a measure of acid, so it will make the pH of the blood more acidic. So a decrease in pH in the blood usually means that you have an increase in carbon dioxide levels. And so a decrease in pH will cause the hemoglobin to release more oxygen. Because usually an increase in carbon dioxide means you're going to need more oxygen because the CO2 is produced by the mitochondria. So having an increase in CO2 means the mitochondria must be pretty active, which means they must be having a higher oxygen demand. So if we look at this uh, saturation curve here, we've got different lines for different pHs. And you should also note that the normal pH of the blood is between 7.35 and 7.45. So the 7.4 line here in the middle, this would be normal conditions. So now let's look uh, at an example. So if we look at the uh, partial pressure of oxygen at 40 millimeters mercury, which is what you would normally find in the tissues, all right, so if we take a line and draw it straight up from the 40, we can see that uh, the hemoglobin is going to release more oxygen if the pH is lower. So at normal pH, our saturation would be about 75%. Uh, so that means the hemoglobin has an average of three oxygen molecules. But then at a lower pH, like the 7.2 here, we go down close to 60% saturation, so a lot of the hemoglobin molecules now only have two oxygens they're holding on to. That means they released an extra oxygen, so that means that the hemoglobin is releasing more of the oxygen at a lower pH. This is called the Bohr effect, increased oxygen release by hemoglobin in the presence of increased carbon dioxide. And again, the carbon dioxide is what is making the pH go lower. All right, so now let's look at the hemoglobin saturation and temperature. So as temperature increases, hemoglobin also releases oxygen more readily. And so normal blood temperature, as we covered before, is 38 degrees Celsius. So the orange line here represents the normal condition. So again, let's take a look at what is going on when we have a partial pressure of 40 millimeters mercury of oxygen. 
So let's draw a line straight up from the 40 here. And so you'll notice that if we look at the two lines, the normal temperature versus an elevated temperature, you can see that the hemoglobin is releasing more oxygen if the temperature is higher. So at normal temperature, again, the hemoglobin is about 75% saturated, but if the temperature rises to 43 degrees Celsius, then at that same partial pressure of oxygen, now the hemoglobin is going down to close to only 50% saturation, which means it is letting go of more oxygen. So it's delivering more oxygen to the tissues. So this can result in increased oxygen delivery to tissues that are very active. For example, your skeletal muscles. So remember, skeletal muscles uh, use up a lot of ATP during muscle contraction, and heat is a byproduct of using ATP. So if a particular muscle is very active, it is going to increase the blood temperature in that local area. So when the hemoglobin arrives to that area, it is going to let go of more of the oxygen delivery. And so the heat is kind of a signal that that area needs more oxygen to make more ATP because it's using a lot of ATP, which is why the temperature went up in the first place. All right, so let's look at hemoglobin saturation and metabolic activity. So hemoglobin and the red blood cell metabolic activity. So red blood cells lack organelles. So we already talked about how they don't have a nucleus. Um, they also don't have mitochondria. Remember, red blood cells are essentially just packets full of hemoglobin. But since red blood cells don't have mitochondria, they can't do the aerobic respiration. Instead, they can only perform glycolysis in the cytoplasm. So they do not have mitochondria, so they cannot perform aerobic respiration. And one of the metabolic compounds that is generated during the glycolysis portion is a molecule called 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, or BPG. And as BPG levels increase, hemoglobin is again going to release oxygen more readily. So this is going on inside the red blood cell. So basically, if the red blood cell has an increased metabolic activity, it is going to let go of its oxygen more easily. So what can change the BPG levels? Well, the BPG levels can increase when the pH decreases, and so this is going to be a complement to the Bohr effect. So if you have a lower pH, the hemoglobin is going to be affected by both the lower pH, as we discussed with the Bohr effect, and it's going to be affected by an increased production of the BPG, and in both cases, it's going to cause the uh, hemoglobin to let go of the oxygen more easily. BPG levels can also increase during exercise, which again is another signal to release more oxygen. BPG levels can be affected by various hormones. Low oxygen levels can increase the BPG levels. And here's an important one, especially if you're going into the healthcare field. Older red blood cells produce less BPG. And if a red blood cell gets past a certain age, the hemoglobin can actually bind to the oxygen molecules so tightly that it never wants to let them go. And that doesn't work well because in order for hemo uh, the hemoglobin to deliver oxygen to your tissues, it has to eventually let go of the oxygen. So in an older red blood cell and you have too little BPG, the hemoglobin will bind to the oxygen and not let it go. And this is why your stored blood in a blood bank has expiry dates and you can't give someone a transfusion with old blood because if you give them an old blood uh, transfusion, that blood is going to have so little BPG in it that the hemoglobin is not going to let go of the oxygen and that is not going to be good for the patient that you're giving that blood to. And then finally, we have fetal hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin is a different form of hemoglobin that is used while you are in utero. And then shortly after birth, you switch over to an adult hemoglobin form. But fetal hemoglobin has a much higher affinity for oxygen. So in, here's another saturation curve. The adult hemoglobin is in red. The fetal hemoglobin is in blue. So again, if we look at a partial pressure of 40 millimeters mercury of oxygen, if we take the line and go straight up, we can see that the adult hemoglobin uh, in the red line has about a 75% saturation, just as we looked at before. But the fetal hemoglobin, 
has close to a 90% saturation. That means the fetal hemoglobin wants to bind to the oxygen more readily than the adult hemoglobin. And this is a key for transferring oxygen across the placenta because when the maternal blood arrives in the placenta, it may be close to a partial pressure of 40 millimeters mercury. And if the fetal hemoglobin was the same as the adult hemoglobin, it would have no reason to take the oxygen from the mother's hemoglobin. But then the baby would never get any oxygen. So the fetus's hemoglobin wants to bind to the oxygen more than the mother's hemoglobin does. And so while the blood is in the placenta, this means the fetal hemoglobin is able to grab a hold of that oxygen from the mother's hemoglobin and take it. So because it wants it more than the mother's hemoglobin, and this is how uh, the fetus actually ends up getting oxygen in its blood. So when an infant takes its first breath after birth, there is a very powerful contraction of the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. Remember that I mentioned that if you have to inhale and all your alveoli are collapsed, it takes a lot of energy. Well, when a baby is born, all of its alveoli are collapsed. It's never had air in its lungs. So that very first breath has to be strong enough to inflate all of the alveoli for the first time. And that powerful contraction also changes the pressure in the thoracic cavity, which is going to pull blood into the pulmonary circuit for the first time. And the increased oxygen levels in the lungs and the pulmonary circuit will signal for the closure of the foramen ovale and the ductus arteriosus, which are the two structures of the fetal heart that we talked about previously. In this section, we'll look at carbon dioxide transport in the blood, and we'll also briefly talk about carbon monoxide, and then we'll do a summary of gas transport in the blood. So carbon dioxide travels through the bloodstream in three ways. The first way is that the majority of it is transported as bicarbonate ions. So if we look at this picture from your textbook, so we start with the CO2 that diffuses into the bloodstream from the tissues. So of this uh, CO2 that enters the bloodstream, 93% of it is going to diffuse into red blood cells. And of this 93%, 70% is converted to carbonic acid by carbonic anhydrase. So I mentioned this before, carbon dioxide inside red blood cells can be converted to carbonic acid by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. And here's the equation again. So carbon dioxide combines with water to form carbonic acid. And then the carbonic acid will immediately dissociate or break down into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. And then that is shown here in the image. Uh, carbonic acid dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. So the hydrogen ions, because they have the potential to uh, alter the pH, as we talked about earlier, they actually bind to the hemoglobin to form hemoglobin uh, hydrogen ion complex. And so this serves as a buffer that prevents the pH changes by taking that hydrogen ion and binding to it so that it can't change the pH. The bicarbonate ions actually then move out of the red blood cell into the plasma, and they move out in exchange for a chloride ion. So for every bicarbonate ion that goes into the plasma, a chloride ion comes into the red blood cell, and this is called the chloride shift. So basically, the final uh, way that CO2 is carried in the bloodstream is as bicarbonate ions that end up in the plasma. The second way that carbon dioxide travels through the bloodstream is that it can bind directly to the hemoglobin. It doesn't actually bind to the iron like the oxygen does, but it can bind to portions of the protein chains. So going back to our picture, Again, if we look at the 93% that diffuses into red blood cells, we already talked about the, the majority of that that goes on to become bicarbonate ions, but 23% of that is going to bind directly to the hemoglobin. So when carbon dioxide binds to the hemoglobin, it forms a compound that is technically called carbaminohemoglobin, or HbCO2. And then the remaining 7% is just dissolved in plasma as CO2. So between the 7% that is in the plasma as CO2 
and the 70% that is converted to bicarbonate ions that is transported in the plasma. Technically, the majority of the carbon dioxide is transported in the plasma. It is just that most of it is as bicarbonate ions. So carbon monoxide poisoning, poisoning is the leading cause of poisoning deaths in the U.S., and it occurs with the inhalation of carbon monoxide fumes. So carbon monoxide is a carbon in just one oxygen versus carbon dioxide, which has the two oxygens. So you can get carbon monoxide from car exhaust, stoves, lanterns, grills, fireplaces, gas ranges, and furnaces, just to name a few of the most common sources. And what makes it so dangerous is that it's odorless and colorless, so you don't even know it's in your house and that you're breathing it, usually until it's too late. And this is why they sell carbon monoxide detectors that can alert you if carbon monoxide is present. So why is carbon monoxide so bad? Well, carbon monoxide binds tightly to the heme groups on hemoglobin. And the hemoglobin has a much stronger affinity for carbon monoxide than it does for oxygen. So carbon monoxide will bind to hemoglobin also at much lower pressures than the oxygen. So essentially what is happening is that when you breathe in carbon monoxide, it essentially hijacks all of your hemoglobin molecules. And because the carbon monoxide is bound tightly to the heme in those hemoglobin molecules, they can no longer bind to oxygen. And so if carbon monoxide is just 0.1% of the inhaled air, it is enough to kill you. And the treatments for carbon monoxide includes administering pure oxygen, so 100% oxygen, and this increases the oxygen partial pressures and tries to increase the partial pressures enough that some oxygen can kick off the carbon monoxide from the hemoglobin and bind to the oxygen instead, but that doesn't always work. So if that doesn't work, the patient actually has to get a blood transfusion. So you give them red blood cells that have new hemoglobin molecules that aren't already strongly bound to carbon monoxide molecules. So essentially, once a hemoglobin binds to a carbon monoxide molecule, it does not want to let go of it. So to summarize, gas transport in the blood. So if we start up here at the upper left, this is the alveolar airspace. So in the alveolar airspace, we have oxygen that is coming into the plasma. A little bit of it will stay dissolved in the plasma, but most of it's going to be picked up by the red blood cells, and it's going to bind to the hemoglobin molecules to get uh, the oxyhemoglobin. The red blood cells then go out to the tissues, and when it's delivering the oxygen, because the oxygen pressures are lower in the tissues, the hemoglobin will let go of the oxygen, and the oxygen will diffuse out into the tissues to the uh, lower pressure, and the oxygen in the plasma will also come out and diffuse into the tissues. And then down here, if we look at the carbon dioxide, when the blood is in the tissues, carbon dioxide is going to diffuse into the blood, so again, it's moving to an area of lower pressure. So about 7% of it will stay in the plasma. The other 93% goes into the red blood cell. The majority of that is going to be broken into carbonic acid, which dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. The hydrogen ions can be buffered by binding to hemoglobin. The bicarbonate ions are exchanged for a chloride ion in what is called the chloride shift. And then another small portion of the CO2 will just bind directly to the hemoglobin. Then when the blood gets back to the lungs, you have the reverse process. You can do the reverse chloride shift. So the chloride molecule that was inside gets put back outside. The bicarbonate ion that was in the plasma comes back inside. The bicarbonate ion is reconnected with the hydrogen ion to make carbonic acid. The carbonic acid is then broken back down into CO2 and water. And so this CO2, along with some of the CO2 that was attached directly to the hemoglobin molecule and some of the CO2 that was in the plasma is all going to go out into the air, alveolar airspace to be exhaled. So now we're going to look at the regulation of respiration, which includes local regulation and neural control. And I am not going into as much detail as your textbook, so use the learning objectives in this lecture to help guide what you study. So let's look at local regulation first. 
So there is local regulation at the tissue level. And so when tissues become more active, they're using up more oxygen and releasing more CO2. So when tissues become more active, the partial pressure of oxygen drops and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide rises. So these changes in pressures are going to increase the pressure gradients, which is going to cause more oxygen to be delivered to the tissues and more carbon dioxide to be picked up and carried away. Increased carbon dioxide levels can also cause smooth muscle relaxation and this results in dilation of the nearby arterioles, so vasodilation, also dilation of nearby capillaries to bring more blood to that area. Because if you have an increase in CO2 levels, that means you need more oxygen in that area and you need to carry the CO2 away. Then you also have local regulation that happens inside the lungs. So we mentioned earlier that the blood flow and airflow within the lungs is coordinated. So blood is directed to alveoli that have a high level of oxygen pressures. And this happens because the alveolar capillaries constrict if the local uh, partial pressure of oxygen is low. So it keeps blood away from alveoli where you have low oxygen and it ends up sending the blood only to the capillaries where you have high uh, partial pressures of oxygen. And then the airflow is also coordinated. So airflow is only directed to alveoli that have a high level of CO2. So the partial pressures of CO2 can relax the smooth muscles of the bronchioles, causing bronchodilation. So more air is going to flow to areas with higher CO2, and that brings more fresh air to those areas. So air that has more oxygen and low CO2, and it helps clean out that CO2 from the lungs. You also have neural regulation of the uh, respiration, and there are several levels of control with the neural regulation. And the first level of control is the respiratory rhythmicity centers in the medulla oblongata. So these centers set the pace of respiration, and there are two groups. The dorsal respiratory group, or DRG, functions in every respiratory cycle and controls primarily the inhalation. So it doesn't matter if you're doing the quiet breathing or forced breathing, the DRG is going to be active. And so the dorsal respiratory group controls the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles because these are um, active in every single respiratory cycle, whether you're at rest or having forced breathing. The ventral respiratory group, or VRG, functions only during forced breathing and controls primarily exhalation. So this is the group that will control those accessory muscles. There is a reciprocal inhibition of neurons for inhalation and exhalation, and we talked about reciprocal inhibition back in AMP1. But what this essentially means is that when the neurons for exhalation are active, they are suppressing or inhibiting the inhalation neurons and vice versa. When the inhalation neurons are active and firing, they are suppressing or inhibiting the exhalation neurons. So if you were to look at neuron activity in these two groups of neurons, you'd see that when the inhalation ones are firing action potentials, the exhalation is being suppressed. And when the exhalation neurons are firing action potentials, the inhalation neurons are being suppressed. So that is what we mean by reciprocal inhibition. This also ensures that you never get a signal to inhale and exhale at the same time, which would be impossible to do. So the second level of control is the apneustic and pneumotaxic centers of the pons. These are also called the pontine respiratory group. And these guys regulate the depth and rate of respiration in response to sensory stimuli so in response to stimuli received as part of the respiratory reflexes or voluntary control over respiration. So when you're purposefully controlling your breathing rate. So the apneustic and pneumotaxic centers adjust the output of the respiratory rhythmic centers in the medulla oblongata. So the apneustic center adjusts inhalation by regulating the dorsal respiratory group in the medulla oblongata.
and the pneumotaxic center inhibits the apneustic center to promote either passive or active exhalation. The third level of neural control are your higher brain centers. So for example, strong emotions can change your breathing rate through activation of the autonomic nervous system. And you can also have conscious control over your breathing. You use this when you are speaking, singing, or like holding your breath like while you're swimming. Just note you can't ever hold your breath long enough to kill yourself because reflexes will eventually take over and force you to breathe. Um, primarily your rising carbon dioxide levels, that's one of your strongest reflexes that drive your need to breathe. Just a brief mention of sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS. This is commonly called crib death. This is the leading cause of death for babies between 1 and 12 months old. Interestingly, most of the SIDS deaths occur between midnight and 9 a.m. Most occur in the fall or winter, and most involve infants two to four months old. So the exact causes of SIDS aren't clear. Genetic factors do seem to play a role, but the age range in which SIDS is most likely to occur corresponds to the time period when the pacemaker complex and respiratory centers are establishing connections with the other parts of the brain. And so it's thought that part of the reason you get malfunction, which results in death, is that you have a problem with these connections being made. So it's hypothesized that maybe these interconnection processes go awry. There are things that they tell you, like make sure your baby uh, sleeps on its back and not its stomach, but that's not a 100% guarantee that SIDS won't happen. So there is still a lot of research into the underlying causes of SIDS. So here is an overview of neural regulation. So if we start at the bottom, so level one is going to be the re uh, respiratory rhythmicity centers and the medulla oblongata. So you have the DRG that controls inspiration and is going to control the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. And then you have the VRG, which is going to uh, control primarily expiration, and it's going to send signals out to the accessory muscles. There's another center here that we're just not going to talk about. Um, there's too much in this chapter already. The pons is the second level, and so the pons can control the activity of the centers in the medulla oblongata. So the apneustic centers promote inhalation by stimulating the DRG, and the pneumotaxic centers can inhibit the apneustic centers to encourage exhalation. And then you have the higher centers in the brain, like your cerebral cortex, your limbic system, and your hypothalamus, in which you can exert conscious control over your breathing patterns. So we'll cover just a little bit of the respiratory reflexes. Again, I'm not going into the same level of detail as your textbook. So respiratory reflexes are controlled by chemoreceptors, and chemoreceptors are able to sense carbon dioxide levels, oxygen levels, and the pH of the blood. And carbon dioxide pressures actually has the largest influence on changing your breathing rate. So for example, a 40% drop in your oxygen levels will increase your respiratory rate by between 50 to 70%, but just a 10% increase in carbon dioxide levels will double your respiratory rate. So carbon dioxide levels have a much stronger influence on the respiratory system than oxygen levels do. Hypercapnia is an increase in carbon dioxide levels in your arterial blood, and this most commonly is caused by hypoventilation or lower than normal respiration ability. And we're going to go more into hypoventilation and hyperventilation in chapter 27. So just to give you the other terminology, hyperventilation, which is a higher than normal respiration, can cause the opposite, which is hypocapnia which is abnormally low carbon dioxide levels. And again, we're going to talk more about this in uh, chapter 27 when we get into acid-base balance. You also have baroreceptors that can adjust your respiratory reflexes. So when your blood pressure falls, your respiratory rate increases. And when your blood pressure rises, your respiratory rate decreases.
There are also stretch reflect, uh, receptors that are responsible for a series of re reflexes called the Herring-Brewer reflexes. And we're going to look at the two big ones. So the inflation reflex prevents overexpansion during forced breathing. So it uh, keeps you from overexpanding your lungs. So there are stretch receptors that are triggered. And these stretch receptors are located in the smooth muscle tissue around the bronchioles. And once you've inhaled to a certain point, this is going to trigger inhibition of the DRG to stop your inhalation, and it will stimulate the VRG to start the expiration. There is also a deflation reflex, which inhibits exhalation as the lung volume decreases during forced breathing, again, to keep you from exhaling too much air. And this is triggered by receptors in the alveolar wall and it's going to do the opposite. It will inhibit expiratory centers and stimulate inspiratory centers. Then you also have protective reflexes. So your sneezing reflex is in response to irritation of your nasal cavity wall. And when you sneeze, you are violently expelling air to try to get rid of the irritant. And forced expulsion of air can reach up to 99 miles per hour. With the coughing reflex, this is in response to irritation of the larynx, trachea, or bronchi. So if you've ever wondered why you sometimes sneeze and why you sometimes cough, it all depends on where the irritation is. So if the irritation is in the nasal cavity or the upper part of the pharynx, you will sneeze. If it's in the lower respiratory tract, you will cough. And then a laryngeal spasm, spasm is a forceful closing of the glottis, and this is in response to like foreign matter that gets into your uh, larynx and touches the area around the glottis. This can trigger a powerful laryngeal, laryngeal spasm. So this is like what happens if you're, you know, when your food goes down the uh, wrong tube and you have more than just cough. You have like a coughing fit and it feels like your throat is tightening up. That is a laryngeal spasm. So in our last section, we'll look at the effects of smoking and briefly talk about the respiratory decline with age. All right, so if we take a look at this graph here, first I want you to pay attention to the blue line. So the blue line that says never smoked. Notice that we are going from age 25 to age 75, and then over here on the left axis, we have the respiratory performance, so the percentage of value at age 25. So at 25, you have 100% respiratory performance. And then notice, again, if you look at the blue line, that your respiratory function normally declines with age. So what happens is as you get older, you get deterioration of the elastic tissue and other connective tissues within the lungs. You also have restriction of the thoracic cage movements by arthritis, so your lungs aren't able to expand as much. You also do get some damage that can build up to the uh, alveoli over time as well. So the bottom line is as you get um, older, your lung function will decrease. Now, if you are a smoker, so you have exposure to cigarette smoke and other irritants, you cause tissue degradation to occur at a faster rate, and this is known as emphysema. So notice the red line for a regular smoker is also going to have a deterioration of lung function, but it's going to happen much more quickly, so the slope of the line is steeper. So you're going to reach the level of disability and then death a lot earlier than a person with this blue line who is not going to reach disability and death until probably out here at 80, 90 years old. Now, if you stop smoking, you can put your trajectory back on the original slope. So look at this person here who stops uh, smoking at around age 45. Notice they're still going to have a decline. Their decline is going to still be now at the same rate as a person who has never smoked. But you don't get any of the function back. So you'll, you'll get your trajectory back online, so back at the same rate of deterioration as a normal person that's not smoking, but you're never going to regain the lost function. So the later you wait to stop smoking, um, the more damage you're going to have. And whereas you can flatten out your line, you're still going to have um, problems because you stop smoking so late, you have so much accumulated damage, and you never regain that function that you lost.
So um, it's better to not uh, smoke at all. And if you do smoke, it is best to quit as soon as possible. And that is the end of chapter 23. Yes, it's a long chapter. It's an entire system in one chapter. And I didn't even cover uh, all of the detail that is located in your chapter. So there's quite a bit that we didn't cover. Um, make sure you are looking at the learning objectives and that you are studying as we go.